This is the seismological measuring station uh, in this old schist quarry here. So this is part of, I think, the Maastricht formation, where a bunch of kind of very stable clay rocks juts out. You can see just beyond here that the the land falls away down to the river. So this is kind of the edge of the escarpment. And it's in the hills behind me that there's this plan to install something called the Einstein Telescope, uh, which is not a machine for looking out or for looking up or even for looking at light. It's a machine for looking back. It's a pair of mirrors that together form a measurement device for gravitational waves. Gravitational waves move through the universe, I believe, so incredibly slowly that we can use them as a kind of way of echolocating the Big Bang itself to see back in time. And this place is chosen because of its geological stability. So this is where the measurements are taken to show that this land is stable enough to to take to take this instrument to keep it still enough so that it takes this it can be still enough to perceive the the motion of the universe itself uh, in Patrick Keeler's London there's this line where Robinson is staring at the river and he says that Robinson believed that if he could only look deep enough into the surface he would be able to perceive the molecular basis of historical events and thus also he'd be able to perceive the future. So it feels like there's a connection right now, this desire to look into deep time in order to understand the future, stuck always on this axis between a future that we, or rather, between a past that we can never fully know and a future that never quite arrives continually erasing the present, continually unable to perceive that actually the, there's a kind of blank spot precisely where we are in our continued obsession with the past and with the future. I'm really only interested in this moment right here when we stand still enough, potentially, to feel the vibration of the universe. This is the fence in front of the seismological station, in front of whatever instrument is buried in the rock in front of us. I, I don't know how deep it goes, I don't know if that's just the top of a shallow trench or of a deep shaft that goes deep into the ground here. But there's a fence and there's a padlock and there's a sign that says for Bilden Thorgang, which I'm guessing means no entry or entry is forbidden. And yet, something changes when you cross that fence. Something is different about your relationship to the space, about your relationship to the machine, to this instrument, to this apparatus, whatever it is, when you climb across the fence. The fence has no rule on this. There is no one around. You can climb the fence, you can stand on the instrument, you can calibrate yourself to the universe itself in the same way that this machinic thing is doing. This is the question, right? Whose machines, or what machines, or how machines do we permit to perform this calibration for us? What is it like the gate that's keeping us from performing that calibration for ourselves, that's holding at arm's length the, the realization or the possibility of a direct encounter. I'm working myself slowly towards thinking about two things, three things, that may be one thing, language, intelligence, and the other. Another gate. This one isn't locked, though the fence behind it is supposed to keep me from going down the hill. 
this is a gate for certain kinds of animals, right? This gate is designed to allow the passage of humans, but not of cattle. It's designed to enforce a separation between us and between the non-human animals that also inhabit this space. It's a mechanism, it's a machine that's designed to do that. It's to allow the passage of one type of animal, a biped, supposedly intelligent, and quadrupeds, supposedly not. I can move it, and in moving it, I can pass through it, and yet never quite permit the passage of the animal. I'm determined to break down this division. I'm determined to say that it is possible for me to experience something outside of my sensorium. That for me has to become the defining element of the human. I don't know why I'm thinking about the human all the time right now, but I can't stop myself thinking about what that means. If we're in any way special or different, is, our only, is the only thing that makes us human our ability to make devices like this that separate us from other animals? Or is it the possibility to think ourselves into other animals, to think larger than us, to think not in terms of separations, but of what we have in common? The fence didn't stop me going downhill. I walked down the path there and found myself at the foot of this geological feature, or what's referred to by the sign as a, a geological monument, looking at the layers of marl, sandstone and clay that have been laid down and then laid bare on this hill. What do I mean when I talk about language, intelligence, and the other. By language, I'm thinking of lingua franca. I've pulled something here a long way. I've carried it from the Mediterranean. It doesn't really belong here in the fields of Limburg. Um, and yet it still seems to resonate with me. I can't stop it going through my head. From the 11th until the 19th centuries, there was a language that lived at sea and occasionally in ports around the Mediterranean called lingua franca. Today a lingua franca means any kind of bridge language or pidgin, but for 800 years it had a very specific meaning. It meant the language of the Mediterranean, of sailors and traders. It started as a kind of Italian, Venetian, Genoese pidgin with Turkish and expanded to include elements of uh, Catalan, of Occitan, uh, and of the Berber languages of North Africa, of Greek, and of Arabic. Uh, it was a language that um, was used by people of every nation in order to communicate. It was almost never written down, almost no written fragments of it survive, apart from in a few comic operettas and letters of note between merchants in, in Italy and North Africa, but it was clearly widely spoken and constantly changing. The quality of the pigeon is that it's always in flux. It's always changing. It's always capable of change. I've been thinking of lingua franca because I've been trying to understand what it is for language itself to change, the relationship in particular between language and intelligence, and how it allows us to move forward, and particularly to think differently. One, another, one of the other names for lingua franca was sabir, which in lingua franca is the verb to know. Verbs in lingua franca, like other pigeons, don't decline, so it means I know, you know, he, she, it knows. It can be interrogative. Sabir, do you know? Do you understand? And so over time, sabir became also the greeting in lingua franca, the equivalent of hello, because when you met someone new, you'd say, sabir, do you understand? Can we understand each other? Can we communicate? 
It's a kind of handshake, a moment in which two people who don't know if they understand each other establish a mode of communication that's different to both the languages of which they started in, that is different to their starting point, that actively moves them forward. I started on this path by thinking about artificial intelligence, particularly its applications to language, how increasingly artificial intelligence is being used to translate between different human understandings, between different human languages, so that humans no longer have to understand one another. The machine can intercede between us. The machine stands between us and we have to place our trust in it. While there are many potential benefits to us, in doing so, ultimately, we are lessened by this encounter. We lose our ability to think in terms of the other when artificial intelligence is something that intercedes between us rather than helping us to understand or even to educate us. In this way, artificial intelligence performs the role of the gate on the hilltop. It says, like, the machine's understanding of this world is not for you to access. You can take the data, do with its exhaust what you will, but you will not learn directly, bodily, from this encounter. You cannot sense this directly. I refuse to believe that this is the case. I believe we can sense and understand these things directly. I don't believe that negates the benefits of technology. I believe that there is another role for new machines, for new inventions to play in our form of understanding. I brought something else with me for the Mediterranean and it's this, it's the form of the octopus. I've been thinking about the octopus quite a lot lately. The cephalopods, which includes octopus, squid, cuttlefish, go back 600 million years before there's a common ancestor with the human. Our, our closest ancestor, our closest relationship with the cephalopods 600 million years ago is some kind of blind flatworm. An incredibly simple, basic creature with none of the higher neural or motor functions or even the senses that both us and the cephalopods uh, have. But the cephalopods do have eyes. They have eyes remarkably similar to ours. They've evolved entirely separately. They are close in the wavelengths that they understand and yet they've come about by an entirely separate process. The eye evolved twice, in the mammals and vertebrates, and in the cephalopods, completely separately. Likewise, the cephalopods possess a form of intelligence that we do not yet fully understand. If the eye evolved separately, twice, it is equally as possible that the mind evolved separately, twice. Cephalopod brains are medium-sized relative to the size of their body and yet are different. They extend into their arms, their entire neural networks extend throughout their bodies. They feel, sense, see and thus understand the world radically differently to we do. To encounter cephalopod intelligence is to encounter an alien intelligence, an intelligence that is radically different from our own and yet nonetheless exists and shares the world with us. After 600 million years of separation from one form of intelligence, we are right on the verge of encountering an entirely new one. Artificial or machine intelligence is coming. It's going to be real soon, and we're not going to understand it truly any better than we understand the octopus. We are about to create new aliens amongst us, and we have no sense of what it is they're going to do to us. And all the ways we currently think about them as intercessors, as tools, as apparatuses 
that are used to keep us apart from one another, to replace our faculties, to supersede us, are the wrong way to think about them. They're going to be damaging to us because they will join the long line of technological tools which have been used primarily as oppression for the last hundred, if not a thousand, if not six hundred million years. I believe there must be another way to think these technologies, to think of artificial and machine intelligences less as intercessors, less as servants, tools or weapons, but as other new voices, to think of them as a adding to the cacophony of non-human voices and intelligences that surround us. It seems to me significant that just at the moment that we are creating these new forms of almost toy intelligences, artificial only in the sense that they are new and have yet not yet bedded into our awareness, just at this moment we're also starting to acknowledge the intelligence of non-human creatures. We're starting to see in cephalopod behaviours types of complex thinking and knowledges that cry out to be called intelligent. And even much deeper into ecosystems, we're understanding the way in which trees communicate with one another, the way plants spread complex uh, messages across deep networks of chemical and pheromone communication. Intelligence, it increasingly appears, is not merely limited to animals or to individual plants, but is itself possibly a kind of network, that it exists as connections between things, bridges and communications across them, rather than purely reflex motions within individual brains. This then is my hope for artificial intelligence. Rather than coming between us, it allows us to see the intelligences that have surrounded us all along. That machine intelligence will grow, join the growing choir of voices, thoughts, actions and agencies that surround us at all times if we only choose to stop and listen to them. When two sailors met at sea, they said to one another, Sabir, Sabir, do you understand? Can you hear? Can we talk to one another? <laughs>